Right, so hello everyone. And today we are very happy to have Massimo here. He's going to tell us about the partition functions of the building science series on handlebars. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm talking about the work that I mean, not super recent, but still there are uh, things that uh, I'd like to do with uh, this story, in, uh, which eventually should be applied to say some John Simon's theories of gravity, ideally. Um, so let's uh, start to define what I'm talking about. Um, John Simon's theories on open manifolds can be given a metric dependence if you give boundary conditions that contain some metric data. And um, also the uh, partition functions of John Simon's theories on open manifolds have a dual role. They are also wave functions in a in canonical quantization of uh, theory. Um, so indeed, this is, has been known for a long, long time. And uh, for a long, long time, we have a very explicit basis of uh, wave functions, in particular for abelian chan simons theories that have very some desirable properties. Um, there, we also have an implicit, less uh, concrete basis of partition functions for both abelian and non abelian chan simons um, and in, in particular on the manifolds that I'm considering now that are uh, under bodies. So they have a boundary, but they are not that complicated uh, in, inside. Um, so what I'm, uh, I want to do uh, in, in this talk mostly is really a change of basis from this uh, implicit basis to uh, a very explicit basis of uh, uh, wave function and seeing which <clears throat> partition function corresponds to which linear combination of the wave functions in an explicit basis. Um, to do that, uh, I will need to find, uh, I will use the method of radial quantization in which I will choose a very bad uh, foliation of the handle body, which becomes singular at some point and give data at that point where the, the, the leaf degenerates such that the whole uh, partition function is actually not singular there. And then, uh, evolve in radial time until we hit the boundary of the handle body. <clears throat> I will do that for the uh, partition function with no insertion, just fucking partition function. And then I will talk about Wilson loops and we'll find that there is a natural way in which uh, a generalization of the framing anomaly appears. The whole story was supposed to be chapter zero of a longer story involving Nolobinia Chair Simons, but that story is actually was only we were able to um, complete it only for a torus and the body. Um, and in the torus and the body, we found actually an interesting identity, which uh, we could prove at least in the simplest possible case by explicit calculations. But it should be underlined by a mathematical identity that we didn't know and we don't know. So it would be interesting to see if that the identity exists. So. Let me start from the beginning, from uh, uh, Abelian and Simon's uh, theories. Here, um, the bulk Lagrangian is as topological as it gets, no trace of the metric in it. Um, a is an Abelian connection. I mean, I'm looking at a, a, a handle body. Uh, um, and um, is there any metric data in the bulk? No, but uh, the metric data can be introduced, non topological data can be introduced. Uh, by choosing appropriate boundary terms. For instance, they can choose a boundary term that they call IB, um, defined on the uh, Riemann surface sigma, that is the boundary term of the handle body M. And uh, to define this quantity with AZ and AZ bar, I have to define um, a uh, complex uh, structure. Right. So is there a level? Is it U1 or R? Uh, uh, the this, uh, the, you mean the gauge group? It would be U1. So there is some level? There would be. Here is a level one, or no. so you're not specifying the level? I'm specifying it here. So, so it, since we are talking about U1 and not, uh, not R, as was pointed out, we, uh, we have to specify the level. We take actually an even level just to avoid any, any sort of the, and uh, even integers. And um, <clears throat> so here we, we can define. Uh, the functional integral of John Simons with the given boundary conditions in which, let's say, the anti-holomorphic <coughs> component of the gauge field is specified on the boundary. Um, 
And uh, um, this defines a partition function that depends on the boundary data. You can interpret them as some uh, uh, thermodynamical potential if, if you want, or you can simply say, well, there is some boundary value of the gauge field. This uh, object is Z, that also defines a wave function in holomorphic quantization. Um, and um, uh, in holomorphic quantization, uh, you um, in coherent state quantization, you give the holomorphic or anti-holomorphic component of the gauge field, and, you, uh, and your wave function are uh, holomorphic in that, uh, uh, in that basis. Uh, to, and you, you, the, uh, to, to make this vector space of holomorphic uh, wave functions in, into a um, into a hyperspace, you need to give a scalar product, and in this, this scalar product uh, appropriate for this case is given here with the same boundary action IB that I wrote before. Um, so this, uh, now, um, the, uh, once you have this uh, uh, gauge invariant scalar product, you uh, almost know the gauge transformation, the gauge transformation. Uh, acts on the wave function in such a way as to leave the scalar product invariant, since IB invariant under the gauge transformation. Since IB is not gauge invariant by itself, that gives uh, the formula at the bottom of this slide, which is basically just the change of the connection by a gauge transformation times some phase factor that appears in front. So this is a uh, rather well-known material. Let me continue with something that is also probably well known, namely uh, that for abelian Chersinus with a compact U1, right, there exists an explicit basis of wave functions. Um, a, a very, very explicit one is given, it was given by Boss and Nair uh, in 1990, and it can be written in uh, the form that they give here at the top. So uh, what does all these things mean? We take the uh, gauge field the, the A and we decompose it, which is a one form. We decompose this one form into a, an exact part and a harmonic part expanded uh, along the basis of uh, uh, abelian holomorphic differentials on the Riemann surface. Remember, this is a wave function, so this is defined on a Riemann surface, which eventually will be the boundary of my handlebars. Uh, so far, no information about the, the ball. This is just a, a wave function uh, with a two-dimensional uh, connection defined on a Riemann surface. Uh, and uh, here you have some universal pieces. You have this function uh, f, which is uh, um, expressed in terms of the Laplacian um, minus the zero modes divided by this uh, determinant of the period matrix uh, omega. And uh, this particular ratio is uh, interesting. It factorizes into a holomorphic function f of the period matrix omega um, into the, the square modulus of this holomorphic function times a non-holomorphic uh, term that uh, 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 whose second variation gives the equivalent anomaly and uh, this particular form uh, was uh, given by Zograf and Takajan in 1988. So uh, this f, uh, this the ratio determinant is not the uh, a holomorphic function, it's almost a holomorphic function. If you factorize out this piece, uh, written explicitly. So uh, what else? Mu, uh, you see that here I have uh, some universal parts, this part f here. Um, some terms that are also universal, since they really depend only on the, on, on the gauge field, but they don't contain much data about the, the topology of your uh, uh, surface. And then a theta function. This is a theta function with characteristics <clears throat> written in terms of the period matrix uh, of the uh, Riemann surface. And these characteristics mu that are uh, integer valued uh, G dimension vectors, G is the genus of the surface, right? And mu, so it's an integer value vector whose entries take the value zero through K minus one. Um, okay, so we have this formula, super explicit. Yes. 
Very good. Would you remind us how mu came in? The, the wave function was a function of a bar. Oh, um, so, well, essentially, you solve the constraint, the gauge, uh, the Gauss law constraints, and that uh, tells you that the, the, the space of this uh, function psi of the gauge invariant functions. Functions of the okay. okay. level of the different it, types of wave functions. Yes, so it labels essentially this mu is uh, a, a, a label for a basis in the silver space, uh, which has dimension k times g and this final dimension. So now you may say, well, this is fine, but this is a wave function. We can, so the question is which linear combination of these uh, uh, basis functions corresponds to the partition function? Of John Simons on a handle body. <clears throat> and we know that it, it actually in an implicit basis, because we can uh, think of this handle body, and instead of just taking the partition function, we can also put Wilson lines inside, Wilson lines that loop around the, the, in the both contractible and non contractible cycles. And uh, um, we are in the abelian case, which analyze suffice to uh, generate a complete basis of wave functions in this case. Except that now we want to, uh, so we, we, we not only, uh, we could say not only that <clears throat> the functional integral done with nothing is any handle body is a wave function, we could also do the same thing with uh, Wilson lines. And if we find a set of independent Wilson lines, then we have a set of independent wave functions right, that can span the entire Hilbert space. So what I want to do here, basically is a change of basis from this explicit basis where, where each wave function is obtained by doing a functional integral on a handle body with Wilson loops to the Bosnian basis that is uh, explicit and is holomorphic, uh, and it's also homomorphic in the in the complex structure. So uh, to be more specific, instead of the drawing <clears throat> that they gave you before, I uh, can write the equivalent formula. So the, uh, and say that the Wilson group to generate a complete set of wave functions on the Riemann server first by essentially the three-dimensional equivalent of the state operator correspondence. Two dimensions you will take a disk and put an operator in the center and compute the functional integral of the theory right, uh, on, uh, on the disk, and that will give you a wave function on the boundary. You change the operator in the middle, you change the wave function, and uh, uh, choosing wisely the operators you span in that in the space of states of a theory. Here you can do the same thing, except that you're in three dimensions. You have one more dimension. So you take with some loops inside the, your uh, three-dimensional surface, your handle body, by choosing wisely the, with some loops, you get the basis of wave functions. And um, so you insert the Wilson loops that are very simple here in, uh, in the Abelian case. They are labeled precisely by the same labels that they used for the Bosnian wave basis. Um, so you have this uh, G dimensional integer value vector mu, when you have zero to K minus one. <clears throat> so the question again is how are these wave functions related to the explicit Bosnian basis? Bosnair is very interesting because it's holomorphic in the gauge connection, but it's also holomorphic in the complex structure. In the abelian case, the complex structure really appears only through the period matrix. Uh, but the, your data functions are, on, are very simple functions of this, uh, of this object, of the period matrix. So, um, okay, let me tell you two failed attempts to solve this problem that would have worked also in the non abelian case. Uh, one thing uh, could be to try to decompose the handle body into, say, n hole spheres, for instance, spheres with three holes, and then a uh, uh, cylinder, right? Uh, the the, the three dimensional equivalent of pants in, in for, uh, the pants that you use in decomposing a Riemann surface. And we could glue, say, the top of the cylinder to this pentagon here, the bottom to another one, et cetera, and create uh, uh, um, handle bodies of arbitrary genus. Uh, we, we run into a problem because the corners of the cylinder and the corners of the sphere um, seem to introduce extra degrees of freedom that we were not able to account correctly. We were too naive, meaning thinking that basically this uh, cylinder is a sphere and this object is also a sphere. It's, uh, 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 this 
polyhedron. Right? There are, if we just say, well, I mean, we have just a sphere, no, uh, all <clears throat> boundary gauge fields can have no moduli because they are defined in a sphere, we don't get anything. So again, we weren't able to use this uh, uh, procedure because we were missing something, some degrees of freedom that live here at the, the um, at the corners or boundaries of the cylinder, and, uh, and likewise, these corners of the holes on the sphere. So we couldn't even make the problem precise, as you can hear from my language. Yes. In the genus two case, the mm -hmm. four is it correspond to the character of the one that we're creating our algebra? The space going from the spaces to the other bases. Mm -hmm. What did it, for which group uh, you mean? For U1. So let's say you have U1 level K. Yeah. So your boundary condition, I was thinking that maybe just gives you the Chi algebra U1 level K on the boundary. Mm -hmm. And to go between the basis that you have a good line in the inside mm -hmm. to the other basis is the overlap, which is the partition function on hand of what you that boundary condition, which is the character of the U1. Um, but we'll end up with characters. So, but. Precisely, I don't know how to answer your question. Because we have a much more sense, theoretical way to, to, to go there and let's see where it goes. So uh, we could also try to compute the same wave function. And again, the idea is to apply it to, to non uh, uh and see how this wave function, which properly speaking is a section or an appropriate bundle, changes when you change the complex structure uh, of the uh, boundary Riemann surface. So you can write an equation. In the Abelian case, it's uh, a heat equation, but uh, you, we know in principle how to write this equation in general and see how the wave function evolves because as you change the <coughs> complex structure, uh, you, have, uh, you have equivalent quantizations of your theory that are related by unitary transformation. So maybe you can start to evolve your complex structure, arrive at the, at the, the complex structure where the uh, Riemann surface degenerates, where you have, say, a, where you pinch uh, the Riemann surface and you have a separating or non-separating node. And then at that point, your Riemann surface really is a surface with lower genus, but with the insertions of some functions, which we have, we have to understand. And so the problem, again, is that uh, when you <clears throat> arrive at the pinching, uh, you don't get just a <clears throat> Uh, Riemann surface of lower genus, so you don't get also a handle body with lower uh, genus, but you need to understand puncture that exists at the pinching point. We were not able to do it properly. So again, this is something that uh, maybe it's worth re-examining again, because if this procedure is successful, then you can write recursion relations that allow you to compute partition functions at high genus once you know some initial conditions at lower genus. Okay, so after explaining two things that did not work, let me talk about one that did work. So again, the other procedure is suggested by the state operator correspondence uh, in which you uh, think of your handle body as being generated from some initial uh, uh, surface uh, by evolving in a radial uh, Time. So let's do something that is not completely correct, namely write the handle body as sigma times an interval, zero r, where r is the outer, is the boundary of the, uh, of the manifold. Now at zero, in reality, we have uh, the um, Riemann surface that generates, so we have to take care of that and be sure that what we write and the quantities that we write are not singular in the middle of the handle body where when they should not be singular. So formally, we can write then your, our partition function as the overlap of some initial state yet to be determined, uh, evolved in radial time of some amount r. We see that this is a bit of a red herring. And then the uh, uh, overlap with the final state that I can write as a coherent state in uh, uh, in holomorphic quantization. So I have initial state evolution overlap with a coherent state. So initial is the other basis, right? So the initial, it's actually the, one of the key points of this talk. Finding what is the initial state uh, is uh, one of the key points because uh, to, to write this functional integral as a kernel, so as we do here, 
uh, we um, well, we need to know the Hamiltonian and the initial state. Right. That's the other basis that you do not have in the paper. Uh, we no, actually mm, in the yeah, morally the yes, but we to want to go beyond the, the moral correspondence and trying to be as precise as possible. And uh, so the idea actually is uh, the following. I will start illustrating it in the case that there are no Wilson loops and then and introduce Wilson loops. What is the Hamiltonian zero? Or almost, yes. I mean, it is, yeah, it's it's zero on the gauge of Vernon state. So we'll see what it does in, in a second. But indeed, one thing that uh, you see is that this R actually doesn't count much. But actually, first, let's talk about uh, psi zero. So the first thing that they want to uh, uh, constrain. So the foliation that I gave you degenerates at uh, zero radius, but the manifold is regular and everywhere. So this imposes a strong condition on what the initial state is. And to write this condition is convenient to introduce some auxiliary uh, quantities. So first of all, well, we have a foliation in which say, let's look at a handle of a handle body or a cylinder, a piece of the manifold. And then we have uh, some, uh, <clears throat> Uh, holonomies that are actually contractible in the bulk. They are not on the Riemann surface, but they are contractible in the, in the handle. So you have contractible cycles that were not contractible on the surface. Yes. The half of the, um, of the cycles are contractible. Now, to understand, to characterize this, uh, it's convenient to introduce an object that exists on the Riemann surface uh, that is called the Strebel or Strebel Jenkins differential which is meromorphic, in, uh, it's closed, and uh, uh, has a set of horizontal trajectories that covers uh, the um, uh, Riemann surface up to a set of co-dimension zero. Now, a horizontal trajectory is given by this expression. You take a, um, the coordinates of your uh, surface, Right. You go around the loop, so you define a trajectory, it's the function of theta, and you compute the uh, differential on that trajectory. Uh, and that uh, horizontal trajectories are the ones for which this uh, quantity uh, is real and positive. That's the strata differential computed on the trajectory. Um, why do we do that? Because, um, well, because we can, uh, once we have the differential, we can introduce auxiliary quantities. One that is and controversial is the metric. You can define a flat metric that has singularities only at it, where, uh, where the curvature is concentrated only at isolated points. And that is given by this, the square root of the square norm, by the norm of H. So you see that here, uh, except at the points where this H has zeros or poles, uh, the actual is flat. The other is uh, um, um, the, that you can define a vector field. Now, this vector field is defined taking the root of the um, <clears throat> differential. So it is uh, actually uh, the two values. So it could have uh, uh, branch cuts somewhere on the uh, Riemann surface, and that's bad. But it's not too bad, because in reality, the trajectory is defined as the, if you want to look really at the differential equation for the trajectory, it's sufficient uh, to uh, say that the trajectory is uh, goes along the flow of the vector v up to some scaling function f that you could make vanish at the, uh, at the offending points where uh, h vanishes. So uh, you can also notice another thing uh, that this, the, the branch curves that you have in, this, in the definition of v canceling the ratio of v complex conjugate over v, which is the uh, quantity that will enter in all our formula. <coughs> So why did I introduce the, the, the horizontal trajectories and Strebel differential? It's because uh, thanks to theorems on Strebel Jenkins differentials, we know that uh, those trajectories can be chosen to be homologous to homology cycles. In particular, we can take the horizontal trajectories to be homologous to the homology cycles on the Riemann surface that become contractible in the manifold. Let's call them the A cycles, just to give them a name. So it, you can, it, these trajectories are also homologous to precisely the cycles that shrink to zero. Now we have several differentials. We have a, um, a way to associate a 
trajectory. Actually, it was associated a direction. It's a, a, a vector that points in a given direction. Uh, the trajectory is something, something along this vector field, or sorry, trajectory is something along the vector field. Yes. Yeah. So, which is uh, uh, the trajectory is given by the equation that I wrote here. So the the DDT is uh, equal to f. So, so for, for vector field box. You can choose a stable differential, which gives you a, a, this uh, vector field that goes around the contractible cycles. So you, have, uh, you follow the trajectory, and that gives you something that can be deformed to a contractible cycle. Now, all of this is done uh, for the following reason, because now I, can, I have a vector with a holomorphic and anti-holomorphic component, and they can say, okay, now the condition that they want to impose on the initial state is that the gauge field, the component of the gauge field along the uh, contractible differentials, uh, 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 along the coordinate that the uh, angle axis of my cylinder is equal to zero, exactly equal to zero. Because uh, if I have a, a, a gauge field, which actually in this case is a connection, it's defined everywhere in the ball and has nothing special happening at the center of my cylinder, then the uh, component along the angle phi must vanish. So I can write an equation of this form. And now the advantage of this equation, of course, is that uh, it involves uh, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic components of the gauge field. Uh, and in uh, holomorphic quantization, uh, uh, one component uh, that can be written as the derivative of the other, so that I end up with a first-order differential equation for uh, the uh, coherent field A, which tells me that my initial state, written in a coherent basis, in a basis of coherent states, is a squeezed state. It's a squeezed state that you can write explicitly in this form, and you see that the squeezed state depends only on the ratio. V bar over V, so it's insensitive to the fact that V is defined only up to a sign. So this is the this is the initial state written in a particular basis, written in the basis of Korean states. Now we have to see what's the, the, the time evolution, the radial time evolution. So the radial time evolution actually, because this state as it is, is not a physical state yet. It does not obey the, the Gauss law. It's just a squeeze state to define upstairs. So, uh, a, um, a billion if, uh, 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 But if we evolve, actually, if we evolve for any amount of time in the radial coordinate, we, what we do, and that can be uh, seen quite easily, I will show it in an example when I talk about the non abelian gauge field. What, they, what you do is that you are actually projecting over the gauge invariant uh, components of this psi. So the radial evolution at the end does something very nice. It just projects over uh, the uh, gauge invariant part of the wave function. By, and, uh, and so this evolution corresponds to multiplying by u, integrating over all the um, gauge transformations. And now, now here, the gauge field, we are talking about u1. So um, we have uh, an integral over small gauge transformations connected to identity and also an, a sum over the large ones connected to identity. Um, so this formula also, so the idea now is very simple. Radial evolution projects over gauge invariant states. So what we can do, we can do and will do is to use our non-gauge invariant initial state as a seed that generates the wave function by say, projecting over the gauge invariant part of the state. So you take the initial state, you integrate over all the uh, Gauge transformations, you sum over eventual like discrete components, and you get a wave function. And now this fun wave function by construction obeys the Gauss's law. Um, and actually, since we are in the abelian case, uh, all these operations are very concrete because the integral that I end up doing is integral over u and the sum over the large gauge transformations is actually a quadratic integral, and it's a quadratic sum. So um, remember that psi was uh, the exponential of an object that was quadratic in the gauge fields, 
the gauge transformation well shifts the A by the derivative of the gauge transformation. So in the action is quadratic. Uh, and and uh, uh, for large gauge transformations, you have a piece that can be written only locally as the derivative of a scalar, but uh, in generally it's just a <clears throat> harmonic piece, which I denote by little theta here. And so you end up with this formula where everything is quadratic. Now I have to integrate uh, this uh, quadratic action in lambda. <clears throat> so as for any quadratic integral, you compute the saddle point and then you compute the fluctuations around the saddle points. Actually, the non-trivial part of the story is computing the uh, saddle point because in the action that I wrote here, there, are, uh, there appears to be a dependence on the metric, the metric defined through the travel differential and the vector V. Those were completely auxiliary quantities that shouldn't appear in the final result. So uh, here we have also a very good check that what we are doing makes sense because when we do this, uh, uh, the integral in lambda, we should get something that in the end does not depend on the vector V, does not depend on the metric square root of H, H bar. <clears throat> but actually here is where uh, the connection between the horizontal trajectories and the practical differential case because we can actually go to the steps to compute the saddle point quite explicitly. The saddle point equation is obtained by varying with respect to lambda, right? And uh, here I've written the, the equation on top of the uh, slide. Uh, to be more concrete, I decompose the gauge field, the, 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 the data that I gave at the boundary of my handle body into an exact part and a harmonic part that I call capital theta bar. So this just expands into uh, the various Babelian <coughs> or Now you can do some simple manipulations with this equation and transform into uh, another one. So basically, do an integral. In, uh, you get an equation in which uh, the exact part of the gauge transformation is small gauge transformations, and the exact part of the gauge field combine. Uh, the dh is the derivative precisely along the vector v, and the vector defined by this travel differential. And then you have these pieces that instead involve the um, harmonic part, the large gauge transformations, and the harmonic part of the gauge field. So this object should be equal to a holomorphic function. Uh, and uh, what determines the important part of the uh, uh, of the gauge transformation, if you want, what determines the, which is the, the harmonic part is that uh, uh, when you <clears throat> take this equation, uh, if you integrate uh, uh, the uh, derivative with respect to the uh, this vector field V along a contractible cycle, <clears throat> right, uh, this expression should vanish. So, because you have the derivative of something, you integrate over a cycle, of course, the integral over a course manifold of a that divergence that can be at zero. So um, if you take an integral over the contractible cycles, let's say that in an appropriate basis are what we the A cycles, uh, um, the, then you should get zero. And that's sufficient actually to say what is the derivative uh, with respect to the vector V right, of this combination of the uh, exact parts, small gauge transformations, exact part of the gauge field. It turns out to be actually very simple. It can be very uh, very compactly, though I did not write the basis of N B cycles um, and an explicit formula for the holomorphic cycles in terms of N B. Um, so what you have here on the right hand side is this derivative of the uh, this exact parts of the equation. Remember that we have to fix lambda, right? Mm -hmm. That's the object that uh, chi is fixed, it's part of the data at the boundary. Lambda instead is what we integrated over. So this is an equation for lambda. <clears throat> On the um, right hand side of the equation, we have a combination in which um, the uh, um, harmonic part of the gauge field and the large gauge transformation appear together. You can expand them in a basis of uh, anti holomorphic differentials. And then you have this theta tilde, which is not exactly the complex conjugate of the bar, 
it's actually the, the same coefficients you would express now in terms of the holomorphic differentials rather than the anti-holomorphic ones. So when you do them, when you plug in these formulas into dh and you integrate over the a cycle, pleasant zero, right? using the fact that the uh, these a cycles by construction are homologous to the um, horizontal cycles, to the cycles defined by the vector field G. So this formula is the key one because now we can take it and plug it back into the action, in the quadratic action for uh, lambda. And actually we find a, a pleasant surprise when you plug it back, all the terms containing the harmonic part of the gauge connection are independent of the metric and are independent of the vector V. So all that spurious dependence that was there disappears completely from the harmonic part of the gauge connection. There is still some dependence, which is also expected for the exact part, what they call chi. And uh, uh, the quadratic fluctuations around the saddle points are also easily evaluated. I mean, those are very simple and, and Laplacians. And uh, then you have to sum over the large gauge transformation. There are some that should be discarded because they keep you giving the same, imagine the, the same contribution to the functional integral. As it's usual, it means that summing over all large gauge transformations around the, the A and B cycles is too much. We didn't over counting. And the final result is, uh, is this one, which uh, uh, you recognize all the terms because you have exactly the terms that you, we found in the Bosnair uh, wave function. So indeed, this is a Bosnair wave function, but computed for a particular value of this uh, um, characteristic mu, for mu equal to zero. So if you want, the, you want to answer what is the linear combination of Bosnair wave functions that corresponds to the partition function with no insertions of Wilson loops, well, this is the answer. Since the, the simplest that one would expect. Indeed, I have a question that goes back to previous transparency. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be shouldn't the H be zero? Sorry? Shouldn't H be zero? Uh, H the Hamiltonian is zero, right? The Hamiltonian is zero, yes. Well, yeah, I mean, well it's zero R times on the field on the uh, um it's zero on the uh, on the physical states, right? Um, you could have asked the same question uh, in, in the Hartle Hawking uh, uh, story, right? You, you, in Hartle Hawking, you, you, compute the, if you can compute the functional integral over all metrics between an initial surface and the final one. And uh, no matter what are the initial conditions on your initial surface, right, uh, the integral produces for you something that obeys uh, uh, the Wheeler Levitt equation. Some but uh, uh, even there, I mean, if you do the integral and you define, say, time coordinate, you will get the Hamilton zero. So the, uh, it's zero on, on, on the physical wave function. We'll, we'll be a little bit more explicit in one case and when we look at the non abelian theory, but on the torus. So. Um, so the story was so simple and the result was so clean that maybe we could do also the Wilson loops at this point. Then we already know this in some sense because the, the formula for this Bosner wave function that you wrote down is just a formula for the conformal blocks of the U1 current algebra. Sahan was asking mm -hmm. for the genes one. I thought uh, that if you do the partition function, some handle body with insertion of Boson lines, then you get the corresponding conformal block that's boundary on with the yeah. current channel. Maybe but I, uh, I mean, it's nice to be right. I was fearing that then you do some X transformation. Yeah, so that's the whole of the correct channel. So, yeah, the, uh, essentially, what I, I don't know, maybe it's obvious, it's whether you the news were the correct labels or the transforms to of some. Discrete Fourier transform of the I also missed out in the computation the complex structure of the boundary and the, uh, the previous. You mean in the, in the in this computation or in the or, or in the 
of this expression. Yeah, the okay. Um, so in this formula, uh, the complex structure of the boundary is a bit hidden. It's hidden in the fact that, that the final state is a, uh, is a coherent state. Actually, so uh, to see why you need to insert that uh, boundary, mm, you could uh, actually maybe to understand why, why you need to insert that boundary, maybe it's good also to go to a simpler case to do the same calculation for the harmonic oscillator in, you know, um, a coherent state basis and then rewrite the uh, time evolution of the harmonic oscillator from the coherent state basis, insert a basis of P or, or Q, or, or, and then uh, discover that the uh, when you set this, uh, I don't know, an X basis here, there is a piece in the overlap of the wave function that looks like the boundary there. So yeah, it's a little bit hidden here. I mean, um, so for, Again, one of the motivations of this work was to try to see if we can also go beyond the billion case, but we were terribly successful in, in this respect. So with some loop insertions, well, it's also easy to do the thing. Loops. Let's start to insert with some loops. Well, to insert with some loops, maybe first we have to regularize them a little because in the, uh, in, in, in the formalism that I have, in which I have a radial evolution from an initial, uh, surface to a final one and then this initial surface degenerates you know, like the north and south poles and the spherical coordinates then maybe we should do something with the whistle book just not take it as it is so we can do, uh, we, do, we can do the following we can take an initial surface that is uh, still a two-dimensional surface and then spread the Wilson loop all around this uh, Riemann surface so instead of having a current this is an abelian Wilson loop so you already you take a current times the gauge field right Instead of taking a current that is localized at one point on your uh, Riemann surface and goes around, say, contractible loops or better non contractible loops, then you, you take this current, you make this current a continuous function on the surface. So it's still localized on the surface, it still lives on the surface, but it's not localized along a line on the surface. So what this means is that you take the Wilson loop and you rewrite it as in terms of a two-dimensional vector with component W and W bar in, a, in complex coordinates. So this W now has a harmonic part and an exact part. And uh, uh, the, the point is that the, the <clears throat> um, Original expression of the Wilson loop is invariant both under small and large gauge transformation. So we should ensure that when we regularize this Wilson loop by spreading, by converting it to, into a, an integral of the two dimensional gauge fields uh, integrated uh, over two dimensional currents, the same uh, property holds. So that the object that I write here is invariant under small and, gauge, and large gauge transformations. And to ensure that the harmonic part of W, uh, which I call W prime, uh, should obey a particular condition. So if you write the harmonic part of W prime and you expand it into a basis of uh, G anti-holomorphic differentials, here I'm doing everything with the anti-holomorphic objects, right? Uh, you should write in this way. Uh, omega is the period matrix, mu and n are, uh, uh, ZG, are um, integers, uh, so are a, a g-dimensional vector uh, with integer value coefficients. Now, since the Wilson loop, uh, this regularized Wilson loop now is gauge invariant under all gauge transformations, uh, you can uh, commute it with the uh, uh, projector of engaging variant fields, so and you can make it act directly on our initial seed ground state. So now we want to describe uh, a, a functional integral in a handle body with a Wilson loop inside. Well, uh, that would be the expression that I wrote here, and then we take the overlap with some with a coherent state where AZ bar has a definite value, right? 
Um, <clears throat> well, we, we have to do, uh, but instead of taking W here, we will solve here, we can make it act on, on psi because it commutes with the gauge projection. It's gauge invariant. And uh, so the, the, it seems everything is civilian, everything is simple, and in particular, the action of the Wilson loop on the initial state uh, does a very simple thing, takes the initial state and uh, translate it by an exponential of an object that is at most linear in the, uh, uh, in the gauge connection in the AC bar. Uh, so this is a squeezed, uh, shifted uh, initial state. Now, once we have this initial state, we can redo exactly the same thing that we did uh, with the original Psi zero. Uh, so compute the, in, uh, the uh, projection over the gauge invariant part of this Psi. Again, all the uh, integrals uh, uh, that I have to do are Gaussian because this Psi is at most, is the exponential of an object that's at most quadratic in uh, A. The rest is uh, at most linear. So again, everything that, uh, that can, be, can be done explicitly. So I, I will not do the calculation again because it's uh, very similar, first because I didn't really do it before, but also it's very similar to uh, what we already did. Yes. What is this? So W is this gauge invariant. W is, uh, so W is a two-dimensional current. Um, so if you have, say, a, a, a surface, right? And on the surface, you have a, a Wilson loop. You can, this is an abelian Wilson loop. You can think of it, this is a current localized uh, along this line. Well, instead of that, you actually define a current that, of course, uh, carries what? Well, you define a current density that carries the same total current when you cut it across uh, the entire surface, which we call W. Is the surface something? No, it's a, it's a classical concept. It's a classical curve. Oh, but it, it's, it's, a, a, it's a J I of the coordinate Z and Z bar. It's really just a curve, a two dimensional curve. It's, it's a number. Yeah. The only, the only constraint that I have is that, so I have this current J, right? Two dimensional vector, which is a function of the coordinates on this. Uh, on this Riemann surface, I call them, I don't know, the coordinate x1 and x2, right? And then you integrate this uh, over a transverse surface, or a n times j integrated, right? and you get uh, the, the, this, what we call mu, right? The total current carried by the Wilson group. So we, I'm just spreading out the curve. Now, the point is that in the original expression, I had something that was invariant under all gauge transformations, that what was what quantized mu. So the, the object that I use to regularize the Wilson loop also should be invariant on the all gauge transformations, and that's why uh, these uh, numbers are called uh, this mu and n are integer. So it's not an operator; it's just a classical density of current. Why is it two and not three dimensions? Um, well, it's because uh, the, the, the three dimensions is the time evolution. And you remember, that I, I, will, I always want to use the canonical quantization. So um, if the dimensions would mean that I define, I also spread in time, which uh, will make things much more complicated. And, uh, you may say also a posteriori because this, uh, the expression regularized by spreading the current in two dimensions already suffices to compute explicitly the uh, uh, what the Wilson loop does on W. You see, if you introduce some time evolution, it will be maybe a little bit more complicated, but with this expression, we get a simple initial state, which also is the exponential of a quadratic function, hence the uh, um, projection of gauge invariant states can be done explicitly because it's given by a, a Gaussian integral. And uh, what you get is actually, again, something that may not be terribly surprising because it is another of the uh, Bosnair uh, wave functions. Already, the fact that here you get a zero is a good sanity check. Here, this mu, the mu that appeared in Bosnair is exactly the mu that appears in the Wilson loop. Exactly the charge uh, of the Wilson loop. Um, if you want to, you can think of the Wilson loop as decomposing it into the various cycles of your 
<clears throat> now, there is one difference that seems totally trivial in this, this phase. It's i pi over k mu n. You may say, okay, yes, I mean, it's a phase. I mean, a phase is a wave function and we change by a phase, but it would be a pity to throw it away because it has an interesting interpretation. Um, and uh, the, the, this arises in this way. If you take uh, the, the Wilson loop uh, that you remember was a function <coughs> of a current that had uh, also harmonic components. And the harmonic components um, um, have, uh, so I can take this uh, um, object and decompose it into, into two currents. A current where I have only one of the uh, Harmonic components that they wrote before, the one proportional to mu, and another one where mu uh, uh, is multiplied by this object by uh, omega, right? Which is a complex matrix. And then another piece, this I would call W bar mu, and then another piece that has some exact part, and uh, uh, also this harmonic part, which instead is proportional to uh, the uh, anti holomorphic differentials times an, uh, a real number, n times imaginary. Omega to the minus one. So um, if I do that and I use the fact that again I know uh, how the component A Z and A Z bar commute because they are harmonically conjugate operators. I mean, one is the functional derivative of the other. I can write very simply this identity where the initial Wilson loop is written as the Wilson loop where you have a harmonic component only uh, proportional to mu. Another Wilson loop where the harmonic component is proportional to n times this phase. And uh, um, so the point is that actually the factors that uh, I decompose the Wilson loop in have a, an interesting interpretation. Uh, the, the first one is actually a blow up of a Wilson loop that goes along a non contractible cycle. While W sigma. Of uh, the W of the, um, of the current with only the current proportion to n is a blow up of a Wilson loop that goes along a contracted. You can just write the <clears throat> holomorphic differentials in terms of the uh, A and B cycles of a real basis and check that this works and the appropriate integrals along, along with the value cycles. So you, you have a, a Wilson loop that can go. Do different things, it can twist around contractible cycles and uncontractable. You can decompose it into two pieces. But the point is that um, when a Wilson loop uh, um, is, if you have a Wilson loop along a contractible cycle, that doesn't do anything to the initial state because the cycle is contractible. You can shrink it to zero in the bulk right, of, the, uh, of the handle body. So when you write your general Wilson loop W, that they're up here, right? You can write it as the product of the two W along non contractible cycle, W along contractible cycle, cycle times phase. But the second thing applied to the vacuum does nothing. So you are left with uh, a Wilson loop that now goes along the contractible cycle times a phase. So essentially, this phase, the only effect of this phase is in, in inserting. The only effect of inserting a Wilson loop winding n times along a contractible cycle is just to give a phase to our uh, wave function. And uh, um, so it's essentially, you can take a Wilson loop uh, that goes only along the uh, non contractible cycle. You could decorate it with other ones that go along contractible cycles. You are not creating new states out of this new configuration. So the configuration. <clears throat> well, the, you have just this Wilson loop, or what you have this Wilson loop plus a bunch of other ones that go around compatible cycle to so the same result, the same wave function, but up to a phase. And actually, curiously, uh, maybe not curiously, maybe obviously, when uh, this number n is itself an integer multiple of the other uh, vector of, in, uh, of integer numbers, uh, vector of integer charges that they call mu. Then this phase is actually the framing anomaly because this uh, corresponds. This actually would gives you in essence the same effect that you will have by, uh, by framing a Wilson loop and then twisting it around the non-contractible loop. So it's kind of nice that we recover uh, in this simple clear case. Uh, so this uh, uh, details of 
more general constructions. And this is essentially all that we can do with the abelian gauge fields with the U1s. What can we do for non abelian? Well, not much, unfortunately. Actually, our method really worked for us only for the torus handle body, only genus one. Well, at least we recover known results. So, the, um, to define a non abelian chance Simon's theorem in the torus, but it's a little bit more complicated than before. So, we do some actually some simplifications. Well, we write our torus as a uh, say coordinate T, uh, that's the height of the top of a cylinder, an angle phi, and the radius R, and then we do the top and the bottom of the cylinder. The torus we can have with a twist if you want to go. Now we choose as an initial boundary condition at the center of the cylinder a gauge field which has a component along the angle phi on the cylinder equal to two pi mu over k. A is the level mu is a uh, is a vector in the um, weight lattice of the gauge group divided by this quantity, by by group semi-direct uh, k times root lattice. And this is the original non-dilated uh, vial curve. C is, uh, of course, this is uh, an element of the Cartan's of algebra with particular integer values. Uh, and uh, the, um, uh, needless to say, if I am interested in the vacuum partition function mu is equal to zero, uh, the final boundary condition is instead um, that the easy bar should have some value. Well, let's simplify life and, and write just the harmonic part of easy bar and put to zero the exact part. So let's write easy bar as some uh, constant um, that I write as an uh, element of the Cartan sub algebra divided by the imaginary part. Um, okay. So now, I want to repeat the story that I had before, but with this particular uh, initial final configurations. So I have to compute the transition amplitude be between two states, a state that is an eigenstate of the angular component of the gauge field, A phi, and has uh, uh, this particular value, and a, um, a final state, which instead is an eigenstate of A z bar, with a given eigenvalue. Uh, the second one is a coherent state, and as you know, coherent states are not orthogonal. So uh, the, uh, now the quantity that they want to compute uh, can be written again as a functional integral. And the, um, if you write the functional integral in radial quantization, uh, when you integrate over the uh, uh, radial component of the gauge field, that gives you a, a constraint that says that the uh, <clears throat> field strength of the gauge field on each leaf of your foliation, on each cylinder, uh, on each torus, is actually flat. So you get a nice delta function, which is by radial evolution gives you a projection of a gauge invariant states. And uh, now this, this integral is, uh, has been computed in the past. It has been computed by uh, decomposing the gauge field uh, on the AZ and DZ bar. So the components of the gauge field along the, the torus, along every single leaf of my, that I use in the radial quantization of the solid torus, we, we write it as uh, a gauge transform of some constant field in <coughs> the um, Cartan sub algebra of the group. Now, once you do this decomposition of the, the gauge field A, the action reduces to that of a spiral resumino model, and the integral over G actually uh, um, has been performed in the past. So, what we did was just to copy the result basically and uh, uh, discover that, that uh, this uh, overlap is up to some uh, quantity <clears throat> that depends on the boundary gauge field, but uh, uh, it's insensitive to the details of the harmonic part. Of the, um, it's insensitive to the details of the bulk in some sense times uh, a Weilkatz character for uh, the, the group G at level K. Again, the result is not that unexpected. We are already arriving it in radial quantization. Um, maybe 
So the, in this expression, notice that they, they took this new arbitrary, right? Mm -hmm. And if you want the partition function, the vacuum partition function, you should choose, choose mu equal to zero. Um, so maybe one interesting thing is the following, that uh, uh, you can also, you can obtain the other values of mu, um, you can try to obtain them exactly as uh, we did for the abelian case by taking the uh, initial seed uh, wave function and applying a Wilson loop. Now, if you take a Wilson loop uh, and you direct it along the coordinates that we call T, the height of the cylinder, uh, you, what you're doing is that you're taking the trace of a, a representation of highest weight uh, mu of this exponent of the T component of the gauge field. So here, we, the radial component was integrated out that uh, told you that the, give you that nice, nice gauge constraint. I mean, the constraint that the F is flat. Then you have two um, components of the gauge field along phi and along T uh, when uh, they are canonically conjugate variables. So they have canonical commutators. And uh, um, so A of T has canonical commutation relations with A of phi. And, uh, um, uh, and that tells you actually that when you apply this object, um, here, the notation is a bit condensed. This A of T means A of T multiplied by the uh, generators of the, the algebra in the representation of the highest weight mu. Right? Uh, what, when you apply this uh, object to the vacuum, right, the vacuum is an eigenstate of Mr. A phi, you get a, uh, a sum of Wildcat's characters corrected. Uh, this we missed in, in our paper by. Uh, uh, the signature of the root mu. So you have uh, a, um, a representation with highest weight, a um, system, uh, a weight system for this representation, sorry about that, uh, called omega of mu. And then for each root inside, uh, you, you can write a, uh, a for each of these new, you can write the, the corresponding by cat's character. And sometimes it appears with your own sign, so you need to correct it. So um, the, this particular sum of by cat's characters is the partition function um, of the, uh, in the presence of a Wilson loop. Um, right, with a Wilson loop in a representation with highest weight mu. And here there is also a curious fact is that uh, you may uh, think that there is another simpler way to get uh, the same partition function. Um, if you take, uh, uh, if you have say a Wilson loop along the direction T, right? And uh, uh, you compute the integral of A phi around uh, the, the, the coordinate, around the circle that goes around the origin, well, what you get by Gauss's law is, uh, which is this, is that A of phi is two pi mu over k, right? So once you have a Wilson loop in the representation k, in mu, you have mu over k. Um, so that would suggest that actually the, the partition function in the presence of a Wilson loop is the, uh, uh, the Wildcat's character for just one, uh, it's just one Wildcat's character, the one for the representation of highest weight mu. But we got another formula right, in which instead we had a sum of our characters. And so these two pictures are the same only if, you, if there is the, only if you have an identity among Wildcat's characters that actually uh, is equivalent to an identity uh, among Wildcat characters, which is this one. Yeah, so you take the, the highest weight mu, you take all the uh, weights inside the root system of mu. For each one, you compute the uh, character, not by cats. This is just by character. You multiply by uh, the parity of the element mu, and you should get an equality. Now, we verified it for SU2 by simple calculation, okay, by it false. We, we, we checked it just for some representations of SU3. We, never, we didn't find it anywhere. So it would be interesting to see if this thing is true or not. What are these epsilons for SU2? Epsilon, so the epsilon is the parity of the um, weight mu. So if you have, say, for SU2, for the case that we checked it, just to, to, to be concrete, 
you have that the, uh, the character for um, spin j is some sine of 2j plus 1. Right? On the other side, you have a sum of instead uh, where you have the, the, the sign of the integer m that varies from minus j to j. Right? And uh, when m is negative, and when you're, uh, you go from minus j to zero, you get the uh, an element uh, uh, with the wrong sign. So you get the sign of minus some number yeah. instead of the sign of a number. So this. Uh, 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 and this comes because the, 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 in the representation with the uh, highest weight nu, uh, you will get the uh, term that corresponds to, uh, the, 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 you get with a plus one, a term that is actually a vital reflection of the uh, highest weight. So we have to correct by that. Um, <clears throat> but again, it will be interesting to see if this thing actually exists somewhere in the, in the literature or if there is a, a counterexample. The epsilon are always just plus or minus one. These are just plus or minus one. Yeah. So the summary of what we have done so far is that the path integral of an abelian change atmosphere and under bodies can be computed explicitly by radial quantization. The, the, the radial evolution from an initial state projects over gauge invariant wave functions. The initial wave function is fixed by requiring that the gauge field along the contractible Holonomy cycle is determined by the Wilson loops, in particular, is zero if there are no Wilson loops inside, and that fixes this initial seed uh, state. The partition function of non abelian and Simon's theories on torus and bodies can be computed by methods similar to those used in the case, but for non abelian and Simon's on, on torus and bodies, we found that the validity of this method required the curious identity among right characters that we could only prove directly for SU2. Uh, and actually, the more, uh, question that we left unanswered, and it's uh, very much in my mind still, uh, though I don't have any concrete idea, is uh, whether other techniques, such as gluing elementary handle body components or writing an evolution equation in the complex structure, could be used to uh, compute this partition function either by recursion or by just combinatorics. So thank you very much. Any question for Musk? Well, can you just remember quickly what's the motivation for the the initial state conditions that, that we used? The, the... Oh, the, the initial state condition was the following. You have, uh, say, a, let's write a piece of the, the handle body, which is regular at the origin. So uh, when, uh, um, classically, when you do the functional integral uh, and you are integrating over actually one form, as I said here, you want the one form that is regular at the origin. And this one form has, uh, for the component A5 is zero, not just zero modulo something, is zero, zero. Um, and uh, the, if you want to translate this into um, a, 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 a now we are not using a, a functional integral, we are doing radial quantization. So we have a wave function defined on, the, uh, on each uh, cylinder here at different radii. And what we want is that our wave function on the initial cylinder, say, obeys a phi equal to zero. So this is well delta of a phi, but we want to write this object in a, a different coordinate basis, in the uh, in a holomorphic basis with a z and a z bar. And uh, uh, to do that on the cylinder, you would say that you take uh, a z minus, now we get the sign wrong, is the bar uh, on size equal to zero, and then one is the derivative of the other, and you get the, 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 the solution is a uh, squeezed still. It's, it's an exponential of a quadratic of AZ R square. Uh, now, we wanted to generalize this uh, equation to a general handle body, so we had to define essentially a clever way of writing the, uh, the component of A along phi. And one such way um, uh, was to use the Strebel differentials because they would give for you uh, uh, 
there would, it would be sufficient to define enough a vector field that could be used to split uh, in AC and in Z bar, and, uh, right? What is the gauge field velocity? Phi direction. So we wanted, in a sense, to write uh, an expression that was valid all over this uh, 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 Riemann surface, <clears throat> the initial Riemann surface, without uh, having to decompose this surface into neighborhood and then finding different coordinates in each one. So we patch together. <clears throat> Uh, may I ask a question, please? Yes. Uh, is the is the existence of uh, these jenkins strabel differentials uh, clear? Because in gen for a generic differential, the horizontal trajectories are uh, uh, dense or ergodic on the Riemann surface. They don't usually close up and uh, uh, give homology cycles. Uh, on any Riemann surface, the strabel differentials exist always. Uh, this is are closed Riemann surfaces. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the this differential is defined. Uh, it must have some singularities. Yes. At a special point, right? Yes. But that's okay because the horizontal trajectories actually for, um, cover only a sub uh, a, a, a set with co-dimension zero. So there could be exceptional points that are not covered by the uh, by oh, these yeah. trajectories. Right. We, we have enough information from the, uh, the co-dimension two uh, region to uh, arrive at uh, the formula for the initial state. I see. OK, thank you. All right, so let's thank Massimo again for a great talk.